Hola, bona vesprada. Benvinguts i benvingudes al centre del Carme. És un plaer aquesta vesprada tindre l'oportunitat de compartir amb vosaltres una masterclass amb Marina Abramovic, una referent de l'art contemporani internacional. Ens acompanya el director artístic de la mostra de València, Cinema del Mediterrani, Eduardo Guillot, i el periodista i membre del jurat internacional de la mostra, Massimo Lecchi, al que volem agrair que haja tingut la deferència de moderar aquesta masterclass amb Marina i, per supost, amb Marina Abramovic, que donem la benvinguda i agraïm la seva col·laboració amb nosaltres i amb la mostra de València per a participar en aquest acte. No ha sigut possible la seva presència així presencial per les circumstàncies sanitàries que patim en aquest moment. Segur que en altra ocasió tindrem l'oportunitat de gaudir de la seva presència, però fins i tot és important tindre la possibilitat de gaudir d'aquest encontre. Esperem que siga del vostre interès i agraïm la vostra assistència i també a totes les persones que seguissin aquesta activitat mitjançant les xarxes socials i el canal de YouTube. Gràcies. Vos deixa amb el director artístic de la mostra, Eduardo. Moltes gràcies, José Luis. Moltes gràcies a tots per haver vingut. Jo seré molt breu. Només volia donar-vos la benvinguda i, sobretot, donar les gràcies a José Luis Pérez Pont i al Centre del Carme, al Consorci de Museus de la Comunitat Valenciana, per fer possible això, perquè sense la seva ajuda no estaríem tots a seguir. I això crec que és molt important recalcar-ho i espera, a més a més, que sigui el principi d'una col·laboració entre el festival i el Centre del Carme que es puga prolongar al llarg del temps. No vos furtem més temps. Thank you very much, Marina, for being here. Thank you very much, Massimo, for, for being the host of this, uh, of this masterclass. And please, uh, it's your turn. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you to the museum for, for hosting us. And thank you, Marina, for being here. It's a huge honor for me. It doesn't happen every day to a uh, film and theater critic to interview one of such, a, such an important and relevant uh, figure in the in the art world, and uh, I think that the, this context of the, of the film festival makes it, in Valencia, makes it even more uh, interesting and stimulating from an intellectual point of view. Um, I want to tell the audience very, uh, very honestly and very humbly, uh, right from the beginning, that there might be some technical difficulties because I, ha I hear an echo. I might have just discovered a very big hearing problem that, I, that I've always <laughs> ignored, but please be patient and please forgive us if there is some problem on, uh, on my side. Um, the distance between us is, is, is very big geographically, but these two close-ups, I think, reduce it a lot, and we are, we are closer, and I hope we will be able with this very young audience of, of fans from Valencia, we will be able to, to build uh, as much as possible to create a, a spirit of community, which is one of the pillars on which uh, your, uh, your art is built. Um, I would like to start from an absence. Uh, it's the absence of the title of the masterclass. I realized coming here that the masterclass doesn't have a name. But uh, I was just given, uh, before starting, a list of questions uh, from the press and from the people that couldn't be here, and they cannot uh, make questions for the COVID restrictions. So they gave me a list. And the first questions I read it could be a nice introduction to, to our, our uh, uh, meeting tonight and could also be a sort of ironic title of this masterclass. Uh, MACMA uh, Visual Arts Magazine asks, it's a very synthetic question, uh, what degree of relevance in your artistic career have concepts such as discipline, power, fear, spirituality and contradiction and their respective energies? I think that this covers 50 years <laughs> of career. So this could be not, not the first question but the title of of the master class. Actually, I would like to start uh, and, and, and let you finally uh, talk 
to the audience. I would start from um, a documentary that will be screened here uh, on, the, on the 30th and on the 1st of November, which is Homecoming, Marina Abramovic and Her Children uh, by Boris Milinkovic. Uh, a very good documentary which I strongly recommend the audience to, to go watch uh, in the coming days. Um, that starts actually from the beginning, which is exactly where I want to start. Uh, your, your, your life in Yugoslavia and in your childhood, uh, a period uh, of, of time that you describe as very uh, dark times. From these dark times, I would like to add. Uh, ask you from your childhood in, in Yugoslavia that had such a big impact on, on your life and on your uh, art? But what we do with the question that we, uh, somebody asked before, you asked the question. We I, have think that this could, uh, I think that this could be the, the title of the masterclass more than, an, uh, more than, more than uh, uh, a single question. I think that we will be able to touch all these points during the one hour chat. I would like to. I, I would like to begin from 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 your years in in Yugoslavia, the, the, those se seminal years, uh, and and from your family story, which is very interesting, and for 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 our audience, I think. All right. First of all, I'm so happy to talk to Valencia audience, especially all the young ones, because that's my really favorite public. Uh, somehow. My generation is complicated. Let's not go into the, into the more you know, specifics. But they always complain about everything. And they always think the daytime is the best time, which I don't think so. So for me, if the young work artists and young audience like my work, that means my work is going to have a chance to live. You know, I, I'm not there anymore. So that's really important to me. But first of all, I came from ex-Yugoslavia. I was born there. I was born there with the military parents. You know, my father and mother both being military. So everything in my household was about discipline and willpower and determination. And this is how I was grown up. I remember my, grand my mother would wake me up in the middle of the night if I sleep messy and my blankets were not straight. So to make me, you know, make them, make my bed and then go back to sleep. And it was, it was crazy. All my performances I could not, you know, do. 10 after 10 in the evening because I have to be home and so I made them you know like uh, afternoon so that by 10 o'clock I will you know I will be at home and I will by 10 30 sleep in my bed so it was so much restrictions in my life and then especially doing my performances was horror of the my, my parents being communist because they've been criticized on the party meetings what kind of education what kind of you know bringing I, I was because that's scandalous how you know i was walking naked around i was you know cutting communist star on my stomach i was burning communist star all of this stuff was absolutely like first woman walking on the moon it was forbidden it was really breaking the rules and I only knew that if I want to survive in this kind of background, I have to make my own rules. I have to make my, my own, you know, the, the ideas of behave, and also to find what is my uh, way of expression. So many artists, you know, they look all their lives sometimes to see what kind of medium they can, they can work with. Some of them, that, that they're, they think they're painters, some of them they do sculptures, some of them, you know, they, will, they think, no, I'm a filmmaker, or they need the words to, be able to, to, to write and make the books. And I was very lucky that in the very early stage um, in my career, I found performance as a way of expression. And I think if I was born anywhere else, probably I, I would not be what I am now. So that restrictions, that discipline, that kind of, you know, determination that I learned in early stage of my life, and which I hated at the time, actually become very beneficial later on in my development. Uh, was there a turning point in, 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 your, in your childhood or in your teen years where you uh, very precisely became uh, aware that you could, you could be your art? Well, the, the, I think the, it's, it was few points, but basically the more, the more restrictions and the more uh, a kind of fight I had with my parents and my mother, what I wanted to really be, the more strengths give to me that I will pursue. 
And you know, the, on then everybody was against the performance art. Performance art was nobody territory. Everybody hated performance art. They was thinking this is something that is that should be forbidden immediately in the right in the beginning. You know, my professors were thinking that was destroying the art. My my uh, the, the you know the the the. the my parents the same. The criticism of my what I've been doing work, it was so terrible that I actually, if I read these critics, I should never leave the house. So all what I was left with, it was my kind of inner intuition that what I was doing, I'm on the right path. And no matter how long it would take, I will prove that I'm right. And you know, performance being forever nobody territory, and it was so hard to prove this. And now I'm doing this half century. After half century, they start taking you serious. But you have to really do that for a long, long time without any kind of benefit whatsoever. Uh, another aspect I think that is, is very important from, from your uh, early years uh, is that you were, you were born, as you explained very well, in, in, a, uh, in a communist country, in a dictatorship. And uh, dictatorships are, are all based on R rituals and repetitions, and 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 many of them, I think, are great performances, and and dictators are great performers who perform in front of huge, in front of huge uh, audiences. So I think that also being into grown up and. Uh, uh, in, into this dictatorship also um, developed in you an interest in, 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 in the ritual, which is such a big part of, of, your, of your work as an artist. Is it correct? Absolutely correct. And it's really incredible how the rituals and repetition are very important. If you look into ancient cultures, the all ancient cultures are based on rituals so for a thousand years repeated the same way, in the same manner. So, you know, I, in my own preparation, you know, to do performances, I will also create the, I, I call this a Brahmic method right now, who are actually based on, on things that I will invent myself, and rituals, you know, to, to kind of create different state of mind and prepare myself for the long duration of work, and like simple ritual that I propose, you know, everybody, even, you know, you, the audience sitting there right now, it's, you know, come to the, get the door, just, you know, entrance door from your house and very slowly open your door, but you don't enter. Very slowly you close the door, but you don't exit. And you repeat this action of opening and closing and opening and closing and opening and closing. Not less, not than three hours. After, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes pass, one hour, one and a half, the door magically stop being the door. It become, you know, you know, the action that you open the universe. You're, you're opening, you're going to another galaxy. This, the, the, the mind shift to another dimension. And it's a very interesting exercise based on ritual and based on repetition. So repetition have a very big power of transcendency. You, you actually have consciousness. And also your orthodox upbringing had an influence on this. Yes, I had lots of funny stories with this because my grandmother was always going to the church and my father and mother was going to party meetings and I was left by my grandmother until I was six years old and every morning we would go to the church and in the church there's a big marble a kind of vase with the water and everybody who entered the church, the rituals, you put the two, you know, your three fingers and you cross yourself. And, and you always put yourself, you always, you know, drop your fingers into this water. And my grandmother was doing the same like everybody else and go to the front, in the front of altar uh, to, to, to pray. And I was kind of bored as a kid walking around and I was seeing all these rituals. So I was thinking, oh my God, if I put a chair, because I was too short at that time, and I stand on the chair and I go and drink all the water from that, from that marble vase, I maybe become holy. So I did it. And I just got absolutely sick. I think there was lots of hands with the dirty water. So, not things to do. But this is how I was you know, doing things, very curious, right from the beginning. And I, I would like to make the first quotation, take the first quotation from the artist's life manifesto, which is 
uh, a fantastic, absolutely amusing and, and uh, very bright uh, and insightful uh, manifesto you wrote which summarizes perfectly your work. And the first uh, thing I would like to read is, um, an artist should not steal ideas from others, which I think uh, takes us to uh, the big question of your, uh, of your artistic influences. Uh, you've always been very adamant that at the time uh, you weren't really influenced by the, the, the culture scene uh, uh, in Yugoslavia and also in Europe. Uh, is, it, is it correct that you kind of started doing performance artist in a very independent, uh, in a very independent way? during your years at the academy in, uh, in, in Belgrade? It just happened one event that actually made me think different about, about art. I was painting clouds, and I was painting these clouds, you know, for, for a long time. And I have developed the entire history of the clouds. Clouds who are shadows, clouds who are projections, clouds who hit the body, clouds as a, as a, as a kind of... Um, uh, how you call the, the uh, black holes and so on. And I went to the countryside lying, very often I would go to countryside, lying in the grass field and just look in the clouds and study them in the sky. And that particular day was not any cloud in the sky, it was just blue, blue sky. And I was looking for where the clouds, but this in that moment came 12 or 13, I think, military ultrasonic planes from the Tito army and just cross the sky and they make this incredible drawing. And this drawing become, you know, more and more abstract and dissolve into blue sky again. And I remember this was for me then such an incredible moment of realization. Why I should go to studio and paint something which is two dimensional when I can go and, you know, take the planes and make this drawing in the sky or work, working with the water, with the earth, with the fire, with my own body. And I really never went to studio again. Uh, but in the same time, what I did, I went to military base and asked for 13 planes. And they called my father, who then knew, and they say, your daughter is totally crazy. You know, you know how much cost the money to, to give her the planes to paint some stupid shit in the sky. So of course I, I could not do it. But then this was the, the kind of change, changing you know, moment in my life, in career sense. I never paint again, and I start working with the body. Your, uh, your performances and your art in general, since the beginning, has been met with, uh, in, a, in a very, uh, often in a very harsh way. You have al always uh, been touched by, by big controversies, and you've also created uh, big controversies. Uh, there's another quotation from, from the Artist's Life Manifesto. Enemies are very important. Uh, you had enemies since, uh, since the very beginning. Uh, do you still think that enemies are important after 50 years? Of the enemies are very important, you know, and the enemies are there to teach you to forgiveness. And the most difficult thing is to forgive the enemy. It's very easy to forgive to a friend. That's the easy thing to do. But to really to forget giving somebody who hurt you, who really, you know, demoralize you, who really criticize in a terrible way you work and, you know, don't love you, that kind of person to forgive, it's very important. It's easy to say, very difficult to do. I had that with my partner, Ulai, we had uh, lots of dispute and problems and even court case. And then finally, I am to the point that, you know, I have to do something about that that feel of, of the, the heaviness in my heart. So I really truly forgive him. And I was so happy that I did, because now he passed away, you know, the, the, this year, that I done this on time. So enemies are great teachers in everybody's life. Your enemies from the six, uh, early 70s are probably the ones that uh, were, couldn't accept your art of that were shocked by your first performances, which are also the most, uh, am among the most famous. I'm, I'm especially talking about the rhythm series, uh, rhythm 10, rhythm 5, and especially rhythm 0, which is together with uh, the artist is present, I think, 
uh, one of the two performances that uh, exemplifies uh, in a very clear way your relationship with the audience. I would like to talk about these two separate performances, uh, uh, Rhythm Zero and The Artist is Present, which is, uh, of course, m much closer to us. But Rhythm Zero in particular from uh, Naples in 1974, I don't know for those who are familiar, who are not familiar with this uh, performance. Uh, it's a performance in which you basically gave the, the handed the control uh, to 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 the audience. Uh, you you displayed a series of ob objects that could uh, give pleasure or pain to your body, and basically invited the audience to do whatever they liked with these audiences and your body, assuming a sort of passive role. Uh, which was a very bold and tragic and also almost suicidal move on, on, on your side because you literally put the ha the, your own destiny in the hands of, of the people that came to, uh, to look at your performance. You know, I like to say the quote of Chris, of the, the uh, oh my God, sorry of the Bruce Nauman, this very famous quote of Bruce Nauman, which really talks to me. Bruce Mano said, life, the art, is the question of life and death. Seems melodramatic, but it's very true. So the art is question of life and death. And I think if you really work seriously as an artist, and every work of art meant so much to you, then you really put your life into it, and which I did literally. But in that time, you know, this, um, this performance came from anger at the period, a reaction on the, such a bad criticism, and uh, being performance artist, artists treated like they are lunatics, they're like they should be locked in a mental hospital, they, you know, our work is, is, is sadistic and masochistic and so on and so on. And I was thinking, okay, what if I do absolutely nothing? I'm just standing peacefully in the middle of the space of the gallery. I have 72 objects on the table for pleasure and for pain, and including bullet and knife and pistol. And I say, I'm an object. You can do whatever you want with me. And I give them six hours, and I take all responsibility, what the public will do. And this was such an incredibly difficult and traumatic experience for me because public in the beginning you know they, they give me the roles they um, they uh, uh, you know give me the the the, the book to you know to hold uh, they paint uh, you know my, my lips things like that but much in a very short period they start really using objects for torture and including pistol with a bullet and I was absolutely there on their disposal. If they hold my hand up, I'll, I'll, I stay with the hand up. If they turn my body in one direction, I stay in that direction. And they, very soon, they cut my clothes off. And they first give me the rose to hold and then take the thorns of the rose and put in my body. They cut my neck, they drink my blood. It went worse and worse and worse. Uh, they carry me around the the the... the, the, the gallery, they put me on the table, opened my legs, put the knife between, and, and it was really the hell, especially it was in Italy, Naples, so they had the three projections that you can see, the three prototypes of Italians, the, you know, the relation to the mother, relation to prostitute, and the relation to Madonna, and all the three elements was kind of exercises in visually on, on me. And I really understood that if you give the possibility to the public to kill you, they will kill you. So you, the much, much later, 25 years later, I done a piece called Artists is Present, which I give public only one possibility, to sit at the chair and gaze in my eyes. And this is absolutely different idea, how to lift human spirit. And, you know, depends what tools you give them to work with. And this was about lifting human spirit, and this was about putting the spirit down in the other one. But I only learned one lesson. Public, if you give them, if you give them the opportunity, they can kill you. It's a very dangerous thing I done. I, done. I was very young and very you know, ambitious. And the, all my people the, at that time who hate this performance, they still hate this performance. And, uh, and it's been in the part of every history of performance art. 
you see, it's very difficult to to make performers like by the big big groups of people. I, I've always had the feeling that somehow the artist uh, was a target. Quintessentially, the, the artist is a target to have, uh, for everything. But in your case, you literally put a bullet in the in the uh, in the pistol in the gun, and and this is, I think, one of the one of the most daring things ever that ever happened on in 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 conceptual art. And this I was ready to die. This was a it was a serious thing. I was ready to die for my beliefs. And 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 this is was the most dramatic. Um, uh, questioning of, of the limits of the artist and of art, I think, that you've ever uh, made. Yeah, and I learned from that experience. You know, first I was lucky to stay alive, and I learned from the experience that I should never give complete, you know, trust in the public hands. I have to create a concept where I know exactly where are the physical and mental limits. And that's it. That, that's, that's why, really big that's why in, the, in the artist's manifesto you wrote many years later that the artist should have uh, uh, self-control about his work. Yes. He, but they also a, wrote very important sentence before that, that artists should not have self-control about his life. Yeah. But you should not have control about his work. Because if you have control over your life, you, you, you actually cut yourself from experience. You cut yourself from curiosity. You cut yourself from the, the unknown. This artist should really experience holy life. And a life you can't control. Things happen. But art, you should control. Um, since we are talking about, with Rhythm Zero, about pushing ourselves to the limit, I would like to ask you, uh, when you feel that you have reached your physical or mental limits, how do you find a way, if you actually do find a way, to move on and push yourself even further? How do you work on yourself? First of all, I learned something that I learned from experience. And uh, I should never rehearse performance. If you rehearse performance, any of the ideas I had, I could never make it, actually because I would give up, because it's too difficult, it's too crazy, it's too dangerous, it's too whatever. So I will, and, and also, rehearsal is absolutely no, no, no for me. I only made the concept, and I dedicate lots of time to get the concept, and also dedicate lots of time to, me, to specify how long this piece will be. If the piece is one hour, or three, three, three hours, or three days, or three weeks, or three months, when I exactly, you know, look deep inside myself and find out this, I think, actually will be the maximum I can do, I always put my maximum time. And then I go into the performance. And the moment you enter in front of the public, you have to count that energy of the audience helps you to push your limits much farther than you ever, actually ever believe you can do. That energy of the public is essential energy. This is why rehearsal is not working, because you don't have this energy. So you stop much earlier. But energy of the public is everything, because it's, you're creating dialogue with the, with the energetic dialogue with the public. And the public and you actually create the peace together. They're a unit. Performing for yourself, i never done, and I'm not interested. And, and this brings us to uh, the artist is present, which is the other part of the spectrum, I think, of your... Uh, artistic experience and it shows the, 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 your transformation and your actually uh, your, uh, a relationship with the audience that is more careful we could say but still extremely demanding for you both as a performer and as, as a physical uh, body, as a physical entity the artist is present I'm talking what is his present probably is one of the most difficult work I ever made in my life. Because people always say with nostalgia, oh, she's not cutting herself, or she's not putting herself in danger. Now she's doing just this spiritual work. But I tell you, all of this other stuff that I done earlier was easier in relation to the artist's present. Artist's present is, is hell. It's, you know, I now ask many young artists to re-perform my work. 
there is a young artist also in the movie, you know, the, the Marina Bramichi students, students, it should be lean that she reperformed very difficult piece house with Ocean View, where she is 12 days without food and, and without talking in the exposed to the public. But, and this is not easy at all, but till now, I never saw anybody who could perform three months of artists present. Because because it's one of the most painful experiences I've ever had. Every day for me would be the last day. Every day would be really the, the moment that I can't anymore. I push, it became become something that's supernatural for me to do this piece. And uh, the moment when I stand up from the chair, I was not the same. I was transformed. To me, artist's presence is a, is a proof that actually the, the, the Performance can transform you, but not just transform you just as a as a, as an artist, but also public watching, which I have many many proofs that this happened, and uh, it's 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 just unthinkable actually when I think about past that I really did it, and um, that change is it was incredible, visible, you know, and deep and profound. You, you wrote in the manifesto, an artist should give and receive at the same time. In a performance like the artist is present, what, what, what do you receive the most from the audience? Did you receive something specific that you didn't, some energies that you didn't know were there and that could um, come out of a performance? It's very funny to talk about these things because it looks so, so kind of uh, strange. But I dare, all my duty or the, all the, what I wanted to do is to give the unconditional love to total strangers, to every single person. I got back the same unconditional love from them to me. It was the most profound experience that you can possibly. Unconditional love is, is the highest form of love. You know, it's easy to love your father, to love your parents, to love mother, to love your children, to love your wife, husband, friends, but to love total stranger. That's the highest form of love. And, and an artist should also love his art. This is an apparently stupid question, but it's fundamental because you also wrote that an artist should suffer and that from the suffering comes the best work. And how can you love something that makes you suffer so much? Like in the case, oh of, my your God. In the case of your performances. I also, I also know that depression is the disease and should be treated. And depression, we should never, the, the, the kind of, um, uh, the mix with the suffering. Some artists have to suffer. Every single history of art, if you read the biography of great artists, they all suffer. The, the suffering is the condition to be made great work. It's, it's a teacher, it's a, it's a gate that you have to go across. You know, from the happiness, there's never great work made because happiness is a state you don't want to change. You live in happiness and then when happiness is gone, then you suffer. But, you know, happiness comes first and then suffering comes immediately. And then after suffering, you go through suffering, come to happiness again. This is how life goes. This is like after rain is the sun, it's after sun is the rain. And this is something that we have to accept. And it's as also a, as, as a truth. It's also an obsession. You know, uh, every artist wants to make perfect work of art. And he put all his soul into it. But on the end, there's always something unsaid. And this is why you have to make the new work and new work and new work and continuously working. Because there's always something which is missing. Maybe when you die, then work is completed, but not before. We were talking about your relationship uh, with, uh, uh, with, with your um, uh, background and your relationship with the audience. I would like to uh, talk a little bit uh, right now with, uh, about your relationship with other artists. Because you have uh, done great performances where you were the center, the, 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 the body in the middle of, of the space, but you've also worked with uh, other artists and, for example, with your um, 
with your uh, life partner and art partner, Ulai, with which you, you created some of your most uh, uh, famous performances. And you also worked with uh, people such as Robert Wilson in theater. Uh, the collaboration with artists, is it something that came natural to you? Was it something that you were looking for when you started uh, making performances? Or, it is, or did it just come you know, the first of all, uh, is the big difference between relation and collaboration work with Ulai and Bob Wilson or Jan Fabre or the Larbi Cheprevi, Damien Gelet and the many other people I've been working. Uh, with Ulai was a love story and we met uh, on our birthday, which is the same day. And uh, this was so much and more than just collaboration. It was everything together. It was really something that it was profoundly deep emotional con connection and the work came out of that very strong and then on the end you know, the, the strong relations also break on the end like everything else so we, we decide to to actually break our relation on the Great Wall of China and each of us walked 2,500 kilometers to say goodbye and then we stopped working together. It was, again, very big drama. I remember the Willem Dafoe, the actor, a friend of mine, he said to me, you know, he's American, he said to me, I think it's much easier to make phone call. <laughs> but I never crossed, crossed in the idea that I'll make phone call. But I really, you know, it was dramatic life, it was dramatic ending. So we've done it in a big way. And... Um, then, you know, I, uh, with Bob Wilson working in the theater, it was a very big experience how to work with the theater with the, with the master of Bob Wilson. With Jan Fabra, I made another piece called The Virgin Warrior and Virgin and, and, and Virgin. And uh, it was quite an experience of four hours performing together in, in the Ballet Tokyo. And then I just uh, done the opera, Pelias and Melisandre with the Larbi Cekravi Damien Gelé, working with the dancers. And recently I made my own opera, which I was directing and playing and working with Willem Dafoe. So I really love different to explore different territories. You know, one thing what is the worst with an artist is repetition. Then you repeat your own work over and over again. It's accepted by the audience, accepted by the market, art market, by the galleries, and you don't move. I am interested in, like, in, I have a curiosity as just a kid. I, I want to try everything. Right now, I'm in London when we are talking through Zoom. And what I'm doing, I'm doing the first TV show ever in my life. And this TV show, the, the uh, Sky Art, uh, gave me five hours of program, you know, to make the, the, actually to explain to the larger audience what is performance art. So I'm, I'm showing the things from the history of art, past and present and future and doing lifelong performance in a studio with a very young artist, five hours, having, having conversations with the different you know, people in this field and just making this huge TV program, which I never done in before. So we had a studio for how, 10 hours a day. And I just came to the studio early today to have this Zoom talk with you. But that's what I'm doing, you know. I never done TV before. I never done opera before. I'm also done the argumented real reality, the you know, the speaks reality um, piece called the lie, which uh, I was the first artist ever actually done that. So I like the exploring the territory. If, you know, I asked once the Branson um, from Virgin Virgin Airlines if he want to give me only one ticket, you know, to go to outer space, but without return. Just to see what is another side. I would love to do that. It's very interesting that you mentioned, uh, uh, well, well, we mentioned both uh, theater, and Bob Wilson and your relationship with theater, because you've been, you, you spent your whole life um, trying to, to make performance art uh, ma main, mainstream. Hating theater. Sorry? I, I, I hate the theater. No? I, you hate the theater, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, I, 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 I read a, a very nice interview uh, um, that you gave in, in the past, and you were, it was ironic, it was, it was very amusing, and you talked about the, uh, the theater fuckers that were stealing from the performance art. 
So I find very interesting, uh, it's an interesting contradiction <laughs> that you actually did theater and that you also explored that, that gray zone between the performance art and, and, and the acting, which is, which is two different fields, but somehow linked and connected. But what I like to say in my defense about that, <laughs> that in the beginning, I really hated theater because theater was everything which performance was not. Yeah. Performance is real. Everything is real in performance. You know, blood is real and the theater is catch up. I mean, big difference. And, uh, and people sit in the dark and look in the scene. You have to repeat, you have to rehearse and so on and so on. So in order to establish my own language, personal language in performance, I had to hate everything else. Once this language is established, one, I become secure in my own media. I was interested to explore other things and see what it is there. And I found out extremely interesting and, and amusing and, and very powerful. Theater can be very powerful, same as the performance. And they're just different categories. You know, opera is such an old dinosaur of, of, of the arts, you know, mm. and never change much. But right now, you know, I made opera and I changed things. And I changed to see opera in a new way. I mean, literally now in the new work, I only, I, is a piece called Seven Deaths about Maria Callas. Mm -hmm. And it's only about dying in opera. In every opera, women die on the end. Die for, for, for love. All they die for love. They die suffocated. They die killed. They die knifing uh, in a heart attack from madness, from tuberculosis, from name it. They all die. And so I created this opera with only showing the dead scenes. And so a normal opera is four and a half hours or five hours. But dying is much shorter. So my opera is one hour and 31 minutes. And I'm very proud of this new work, actually. And, and I hope to come to Spain. I really hope. We, I'm sure they hope. They hope so. Uh, I, really. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, hope, I hope it will come to Italy, actually, because I'm Italian. Italy is coming. <laughs> Italy premiere is announced four of the of December in Naples, the, 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 the San Carlo, Theater San Carlo, one of the oldest theater. We are opening actually the opera season in San Carlo in Naples. I hope they will reopen the theaters on time because right so, now they are, they are so, closed, unfortunately. No, but they told us that the opening will be the 24th of November. Okay. This is the news I received three hours ago. Okay, okay. So let's see. Uh, you, uh, I, I, I want to go back to my, to my previous questions. You were uh, talking about um, the relationship between the performance art, uh, art and, and, and the other uh, media. Um, you often said that um, other media steal from the performance art and from, a, from the experience of a performance artist. Uh, my feeling, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that it is actually the case, and that they steal only the superficial part, uh, not the, the risk. They don't uh, emulate the, the risk, which is the core of uh, performance art. No, in this uh, television series I'm working on uh, about performance art, I have a, um, I'm showing a, a 64 artists from 31 countries uh -huh. and in the different teams. There is one performance aspect in film, performance aspect in dance, performance aspect in fashion, performance aspect in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the, you know, television. There are lots of interesting aspects and I can tell you that some, some let's say if you talk the dance, let's, talk the, let's take the piece of dance. There is a Pina Bausch who actually put the actresses and dancers in a very difficult situations. You know, she made dance of them, you know, let them dance in the snow with naked feet or dance them, dance on the rain and dance the mod, which is very physical and demanding thing and really push the limits of the body. And her actually elements of dance are really touching the performance field. So there's a lot of things that you actually can cross that in many ways. But nobody puts the bullet in the gun. Okay, I'm the only one, so what? <laughs> <laughs> what we can do about that? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I want to uh, close with a very, uh, very interesting quote, I think, from, 
from the artist's life manifesto. Unfortunately, unfortunately as I was saying, um, we cannot have uh, questions from uh, the audience for because of the COVID protocols. And you've actually uh, answered to some of, to most of the questions that uh, that I was giving at the beginning. But I would like to, to close with with this, which is very interesting and, and, and also a bit creepy, I think. An artist should look at the symbols of his work of, or her work for the signs of different death scenarios. <laughs> I, I think it's, <laughs> it's my favorite from the, from the artist manifesto. The, the relationship you know, between art and death. And the yeah, because every artist, if he has strong intuition, if he's a creative person, if he's a sensitive person, really know when the time comes. They all of us know. And some of them made a ritual out of it. I mean, Eve Klein, you know, been found it on the table in very ritual, you know, the, the, you, the, the kind of uh, cape lying on the table dead. You know, and nobody know how he got there, but he really knew it, and he make a ritual spectacle out of his death. Um, Gino de Domenicis, another Italian artist, he suicide and also been found it, you know, in the studio on the table. Nobody knows how he got there. So the people really kind of choreograph their own ending, and the, this one and the other ones that they knew when the time comes, you know, to be around their loved ones. And, uh, and the pathway that way. <clears throat> for me, it's very important part in this manifesto when I said for what is the most important, not just for an artist, but the general human being, that you should die without fear, without, um, you know, without fear and consciously. You know, that's a very important thing. Without fear, without anger and consciously. If you can manage these three things, then passage from life to death it's very important because, you know, there are two important things in our life, our, when we are born and we die. And everything that else is in between is life. And, uh, you know, the Sufi always say this beautiful sentence. They say, life is a dream that is waking up. We have to be conscious waking up. We have to see what is on the other side. I believe in that. And I believe that, that anger and fear is a very big obstacle. We have to really understand and peacefully accept destiny. And actually, the, the possibility of, of staging uh, your own death is, is the great privilege of the artist, right? Yeah, that's my decision. I have all ideas about my funeral. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell everything. Even in Bob Wilson, in the, the, the movie, you know, the theater piece, like the death of Marina Bramwich, we start with three marinas and three coffins and everything. So, and I was there, I have to lie before public coming to, into, into the theater. So I'm there lying for half an hour already in the coffin thinking, who's going to be on the first row? Who's going to cry? Who's going to come? You know, yeah. having this whole recognition of the own thing. Anyway. Uh, to close this, uh, this wonderful meeting, uh, I would like to ask you, if you want, and if you have it, uh, if you want to give a piece of advice to the aspiring artists that are maybe sitting here in the audience uh, to add something to all the great things that you've said tonight, if there is a specific advice for, for the aspiring artists that are among us tonight. You know, I j before that, I want to say that um, Laurie Anderson and Lou Reed, they've been living together a while and they married and they met and it just was a wonderful relationship and uh, when they got together they decide three things in their life which I think was very helpful and I like it for me so I like to share that one was the first one was uh, don't be afraid of anybody and anything the second one was have a good detector of bullshit that you really recognize what is the bullshit in your life, in the friendships, in your decisions, in everything. And the third thing they say, and don't forget, don't forget to be tender and gentle. So that's wonderful. I think to, to, you know, just for everybody else. For an artist, I have a different advice. For an artist, it's so important 
to really find deep inside themselves who they are and to use the intuition and to use the, the heart working in making the work. And they have to love what they're doing with a big passion, addiction, really love, have a fever about that, about the, the your own work. And uh, don't look around, don't copy the, the big, you know, other artists, just be yourself. And that's the most difficult to do, but be yourself. And then the last advice, always have humor. Humor is so important. We have to love, first about ourselves, about everything else. But humor is essential. Humor can make us survive obstacles. Thank you very much, Marina. It was wonderful talking to you. You had the good questions. <laughs> And now I, I, I will do a, my, my, something for the performance. I will remove my mask, and without the mask, again, grazie mille. We only forgot the one more important thing for Manifesto. Huh. Artists should never fall in love with another artist. I, I read this rule twice, but I'm just telling you, okay. don't fall in love with that as Trump. Remember it. Anyway, I love all of you. Good night. Thank Goodbye. you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Gracias. <laughs>